So tonight we are reading Matthew 15, 21 through 39. Okay, Matthew 15, 21 through 39. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. <laughs> And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Jesus went away. I'm sorry, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great, great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven, and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given them, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men, besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. And this is God's word. <coughs> Lord, we come to you tonight and we're grateful for your word and Lord, we, uh, we do just want to bring a few things before you as well, Lord, we do want to pray for Lisa's dad, Lord, I pray that you would heal him, raise him up quickly, Lord, give the doctors wisdom as they're ministering to him, and Lord, I do also want to pray for a guy named Randy, Lord, who's making signs for us as the church, he's been in the hospital, don't know exactly what's going on with him, but Lord, you know what he needs, Lord. And, uh, and Father, I, I just sense that you're doing a work in his life. And if you want to use Impact Church to be part of that, Lord, uh, we ask that he would use us to minister grace into his life. And, and Father, for tonight, Lord, as we open your word together, as we see the acts of Jesus, Lord, may we understand what you're doing in this church, what you want to do through this church, Lord, and may we have a clear vision of the love of God that's being poured out to us, Lord. And so, tonight, Lord, we ask that you would be here, that your spirit would guide us, and we pray all these things now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, we've had a lot going on recently in the church. Um, this last Friday, we had an opportunity to connect with some college students from Rio Hondo, through uh, InterVarsity. Um, you guys probably might have met Eric and Christy who've been out here a couple times. They, they are the missionaries for InterVarsity who moved out here from Texas. And they specifically are, um, 
they have a heart for college students and want to see college students come to Christ, and specifically they're working at Rio Hondo, and so they wanted to have a gathering at our house, and so there was about six of them, it was a small core group of, uh, of Christian leaders there that were already part of that campus, and, uh, and we had a chance to connect with them, and I'm sure there'll be more opportunities in the future for all of you guys to get to meet them, and, and there, there's more to come there. And, we had a good time with them, and as the night dwindled down, we were just kind of sitting around and played a few games, and then uh, then the guys started telling riddles. Um, you know, we're trying to all trying to stump each other, and one of the guys looked up uh, some of the riddles from the movie The Hobbit, and here's one of them: It can be seen, cannot be felt; cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind the stars and under the hills, and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life and kills laughter. So as soon as you guys get that, we'll keep going. <laughs> Just kidding. The answer is darkness. So I don't want you guys to be stuck there um, trying to figure that out. So we're not going to talk about riddles tonight, but one thing that you notice in that riddle is that the, the riddle is describing the object or the answer of the riddle by, by giving a description of what it's talking about. And that's exactly what we're going to see Jesus doing tonight in a few interactions that he's going to have with people. But instead of trying to hide something, he's actually exposing the truth. Instead of trying to hide the truth with a riddle, he's exposing the truth through actions. And the truth that he's exposing is the love of God. So here's, here's one of the things that we'll see about God's love tonight, and that is its breadth. The breadth of the love of God, because what we're going to see is Jesus now doing some of the same acts of mercy that he's done for the Jews, now doing those same things amongst the Gentiles. As the rejection of Israel against Jesus grows, we see Jesus' interaction with the Gentiles also growing. So here's what we're going to see about the love of tonight. Jesus is going to show us that God's love is small enough to focus on the faith of one person. That God's love is wide enough to relieve the diversity of human suffering. And that God's love is big enough to supply the magnitude of human need. Small enough for the faith of one person, wide enough for the diversity of human suffering, big enough for the magnitude of human needs. Let's go ahead and pray one more time before we get into your word. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, help us to see you clearly. Lord, that's why we're here. We don't want to learn the Bible. We want to get to know our God. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would do just that, that your spirit would do what Jesus promised it would. It would reveal him to us. So Lord Jesus, reveal yourself to us through your word, by your spirit, in your name. Amen. God's love is small enough to focus on the faith of one person. Matthew 15, verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he didn't answer her a word. And his disciples began begging him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. And he answers, I was sent, and he answered, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It's not right for the children for the children's bed to be thrown to the children's bread to be thrown to dogs. And she said, yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So Jesus, after he's been dealing with the Pharisees and their unbelief and their nitpicking of him and his disciples about their laws and traditions and constantly accusing them of being rule-breaking, rebellious people, J Jesus leaves the Galilee and heads into the heart of Gentile country. It's actually the heart of Philistine country, Tyre and Sidon. Now, I, I get why I would do something like that, right? But is Jesus prone to spite? 
is Jesus saying, all right, I'll show these knucklehead Pharisees and scribes a thing. I'm going to the Gentiles. Forget them. Well, not exactly. You might remember back in Matthew 11, a few weeks or months ago, whenever we were there, that Jesus pronounced a series of woes on some Jewish cities, right? Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, this city and that city. And he's saying all of those things because of all the miracles that he had done there, and yet they still would not believe. And then he goes on to say, besides your unbelief, if I had done these same miracles that I've done in your cities, in, in Gentile cities and in, in Philistine cities like Tyre and Sidon, they would believe. And you guys won't even believe. If I had done these miracles in the cities of your arch enemies, they would have repented. And so it seems that this trip that Jesus is on up to Tyre and Sidon is to prove his point. Both Matthew and Mark talk about this little excursion to Tyre and Sidon. And they both tell us something else about that trip. And that is, he, he only has one single encounter in Tyre and Sidon. And then he goes back to Galilee. It seems that Jesus had a divine appointment with a divine purpose. And of all the people that Jesus would choose to meet when he goes to Tyre and Sidon, as a distinguished Jewish rabbi, he meets with a Gentile woman, right? As 21st century Westerners, right, a little more liberated, we, we, we don't see that as a big deal. But to a first century Jew, there wasn't anybody less important in the world than a Gentile, especially a Gentile woman. And yet, Jesus travels with his disciples 75 miles, one way, on foot, to see just that woman. And, and to make the story more amazing, in Mark's version, which is in Mark 27, uh, chapter 7, verse 24, we see that Jesus went incognito, right? He's trying to flow, fly below the radar. He doesn't want anybody to know he's there. And yet, this woman still found him. She was so desperate for a touch from God that she sought out, she, she heard that he might be in the area, and she goes out and she finds him. It, it seemed like, I'm sure for her, that God was hiding from her, that Jesus was hiding from her, and that it was her that was actually forcing the issue, that she was having to seek him out. And yet, what she didn't know is that the whole reason he came to Tyre and Sidon was for her. The same is true for us. The Bible is clear. Though there may be times that we don't realize it, it seems like we're having to chase down God. We're running after Him. But listen, the Bible says that it's always, always, always Him who comes looking for us. He's the initiator. We're the responder. And that's what this woman would soon find out for herself. She would see that Jesus came to this region of Tyre and Sidon just for her, to show her that God's love was small enough to focus on the faith of one person, even if that one person is a Gentile and a woman. Now having said all of that, we quickly notice that this encounter between Jesus and this woman doesn't really start off like a Hallmark card or a Precious Moments figurine, right? Matthew describes this woman as a Canaanite. This actually, this word Canaanite, is this is the only place in the entire New Testament that you'll find this word. Mark calls the woman a Syrophoenician. I'm glad he uses Canaanite because it's easier to say than Syrophoenician. But Syrophoenician means Mark was using to describe where this woman actually came from, her, her area of origin. But Canaanite is more descriptive. It means not only where she was from, but what she was like. It means that she was from this area in every way. That her lifestyle was that of a Canaanite. That her moral standards were in line with the Canaanites, not the Jews. They were in conflict with God's law. And that her religious practices were also of the Canaanites. She was an idolater. And yet, this is the woman that Jesus came to see. 
And, and the conversation between this Canaanite woman and Jesus starts out exactly how you would expect it to start out between a Jewish rabbi and a pagan woman. First, he just ignores her. Right? And then when she doesn't go away, he treats her with some outward disdain. And he basically says to her, don't you know that what I have is for God's children? Not for Gentile dogs like you? Not exactly what Billy Joel had in mind when he said, leave a tender moment alone, right? <laughs> that was harsh. But Jesus and his harshness has a point. He was coming to fulfill what he had already prophesied in chapter 11, that Tyre and Sidon would respond to him more appropriately than God's people had, even when he treated them the same way they would. At this point, look how this Canaanite woman from Tyre and Sidon addresses him in verse 22. Have mercy on me, son of David. It might not seem like it, but that is a loaded statement, especially for this woman. And the fact that she's willing to call him by that title shows her faith, and it also shows her desperation. This woman called out to Jesus with his messianic title, son of David. 750 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah said that the, when the Messiah comes, he will sit on the throne of his father, David. That the Messiah would be the son of David. And now this Gentile woman, this Canaanite woman, is calling out to this Jewish rabbi and calling him by the name of the Jewish Savior and begging for mercy. But remember, not only is this Gentile country, this is a specific kind of Gentile country. This is Philistine country. And, and you might remember David's relationship with the Philistines. Not exactly friendly. You might remember one Philistine in particular. <laughs> slingshot, rock, big tall guy, Goliath. Right? And then later on, it gets even worse. It says that David's mighty men came in and wiped out the rest of the Philistine giants. And now this woman is calling out to the son of her arch enemy. I took a business trip a, a few years ago to Foley, Alabama. It's just as glorious as it sounds, right? I don't know if you know anything about the culture in the South, but God is first, but not too far behind is college football. Right? And, and which team you root for is a big deal. It could separate families. And, and when I went into the plant where I was there to visit and, and observe, I noticed something. That some of the shop floor areas were crimson, and some of them were orange and blue. The University of Alabama is the Crimson Tide, and the Auburn University is the Auburn Tigers, blue and orange. The plant was as divided as the Hatfields and McCoys. They didn't even sit together in the cafeteria, right? It was true rivalry. That's what it was like between the Jews and Gentiles, especially the Philistines. And yet, somehow, this woman has the faith to believe that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, would be merciful to her. And Jesus sees that faith. And after ignoring her, he kicks it up a notch and he, and he insults her, right? Jews would often refer to non-Jews as dogs. And that's how Jesus addresses her. Now granted, the word that Jesus used is not the vicious street dog, but the name for a pet. But does that really matter? Right? If you call me Cujo... Or you call me Charleston. <laughs> Neither one are compliments. Right? You're still calling me a dog. And, and that's the point here. Jesus is addressing this woman as a typical Jew would address a Gentile. 
Remember, Jesus came to connect with this one woman, but also to fulfill what he had said about Tyre and Sidon. Not Sidon, Sidon. That they, that Tyre and Sidon, that the Gentiles would be more receptive to him than the Jews were if they were given a chance. And to make that point crystal clear, he doesn't give this woman any special treatment. He treats her as any rabbi of his day would. But lest we think that Jesus is just plain rude, I believe that he saw her faith ahead of time. He knew that this woman could see right through the words that were coming out of his mouth as she looked into the eyes of the compassionate, godly universe. And we know that by her response because she does not miss a beat. I love that she throws it right back at him. She answers back by being called a dog but saying, even dogs get crumbs from the master's table. She's saying, I know that that's how your people see me. But I know that that's not how you see me. I may have no religious or social status, but I trust that you'll be merciful to me. I will never be a Jew, but that doesn't mean I'm beyond the help of the Savior. I can just see a smile come across Jesus' face as he meets this spunky, faithful Gentile woman and says, woman, great is your faith. And he heals her daughter. It reminds me of Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Let me read it to you. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect is tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us with confidence draw to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find help in our time of need. When it came to religious acceptance, this woman was on the outside looking in. And yet, somehow, she has this amazing confidence. And I believe that that confidence came from the sympathy that she felt when she was in the presence of Jesus. Hebrews 15, 4.15, like we just said, Jesus, our high priest, sympathizes with our weaknesses because he's experienced every one of them. And if you remember, Jesus himself is now coming off of the rejection, the religious rejection of his own people. And as a human man, that hurts of that rejection was real. And he carried that into that interaction with this woman. And when this woman looked into his eyes, she saw that sympathy. That woman, when she looked into his eyes, religious formality would have just driven her away in fear with the rejection that she was used to. But yet, the love and mercy of a gracious Savior who sympathizes with her weakness gave her confidence to draw near instead of running away. How about you? Do you have that kind of confidence? What do you need tonight? Maybe you need forgiveness. Maybe you're even shocked at what you've done, what you're capable of. Listen, the throne of God is called the throne of grace. Not because God doesn't care about sin. God is radically holy. It's called the throne of grace because God judges sin, but Jesus has taken the punishment that all of us deserve for our sin so that we can find mercy and grace that we so desperately need to keep following the Holy God. Maybe your needs tonight are different. Maybe it's financial, physical, emotional. Whatever you need, you can go to Him with confidence, knowing that you'll find the mercy and grace that you need. Listen, I, I don't even claim to know how God's going to answer 
God's not a vending machine that spits out what we want. But He's a loving Father that lavishes on us what we need. Even when we don't deserve it. Especially when we don't deserve it. That's grace, right? That's what it is. He'll answer like a loving Father does. In love. He'll do whatever is best for you. Even if it's not what you want, for His glory and your good. For this woman and for us, God's love is small enough to meet one person, to meet you right where you're at. But His love is also wide enough to relieve the diversity of human suffering. Verse 29, Matthew 15. And Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee and went up on the mountain and sat there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So after one encounter in Tyre and Sidon, Jesus heads back down to the Sea of Galilee. And in Mark's account, it says that Jesus headed for the Decapolis, which is actually in the southeast corner of the Galilee on the Gentile side, which means that they probably traveled along the eastern shore of the Galilee, along the Gentile side of the Galilee. So we see Jesus continually reaching beyond just the nation of Israel to all hurting people. And it says that the crowds were great and that they were bringing all of their hurting people to Jesus. And once again, what we see is Gentiles coming to Jesus in faith. What we see is those who are far from God drawing near to Him. Religious outcasts and sinners Drawing, drawing near to the one who is willing and able to meet their needs. Listen, it's not easy, right, to drag somebody. It says that Jesus went up on a hill. It's not easy to drag someone who's lame or crippled or even to guide someone who's blind up a hill. But that's exactly what they did when they brought them to Jesus. Now, do you think they would have done that if they thought they were going to be judged or rejected? Jesus. Based on what they had heard, based on what they had seen, they had faith that Jesus would have compassion on them. Let me ask you this. Do you think that in our day, those that are hurting and those who are far from God, do you think that they would come looking to the church for help in their time? Those who don't yet know Jesus, do you think that they would come looking to the people who bear his name, Christians, to get what they need? Is the reputation of God's people one of mercy and grace? Or have we driven them to look elsewhere for help? Because instead of mercy and grace, we have a reputation of judgment and rejection. And then to add insult to injury, we judge them for looking to psychiatrists instead of the Savior, to Prozac instead of the Prince of Peace, to Jack Daniels instead of the Gospel of John. These people who lived on the eastern bank of the Galilee they were willing to travel who knows how far, dragging their inv invalid friends and family members to see Jesus. And, and we'll see that not only did they get healing, not only did they get what they came for, but they stayed with Jesus for three days without food. Some of those, I'm sure, were healed on the first day, but yet they stuck around. They couldn't make themselves leave. They may have came for, with all kinds of wrong motives. They may have come for a handout. They may have come just for a healing. But when they tasted the gracious love of their Savior, they stayed. Look at the response of the people in verse 31. It says, they glorified the God of Israel. 
Not their God. Not God, the God of Israel. Up to this point, they're not even believers. <coughs> but they're glorifying the God of Israel. But I tell you what, when it was all over, they were believers. Listen, the Holy Spirit is careful to explain that all of the miracles that Jesus had done up to this point for the Jews that only hardened their hearts, he was now doing for the Gentiles, and we see it resulting in true faith. When they tasted the grace of God, their cold, hard, Gentile hearts melted into a puddle of willing obedience to the one who loved them in spite of who they were, not because of who they were. Can we say that about the church today? Are those who come into the church with wrong motives confronted with such a scandalous grace that they're changed by it? Or do they get something else? How many of you guys have seen the epic motion picture, Ice Age? <laughs> right? You gotta love Scrap, right? That prehistoric squirrel and, and his quest to try to hang on to that acorn that keeps showing up throughout the whole movie. For those of you who haven't seen you have no idea what I'm talking about. Ice Age is an animated movie with a storyline that runs through the Ice Age, thus the name of the movie. And, but in this story, it's the story of a mammoth named Manny, right? I don't know why, it's a kind of an interesting name for a mammoth, played by uh, Ray, what's Ray's last name? Romano. Ray Romano, right? He's the voice of, of Manny. And a sloth named Sid. And these two become unlikely friends when they have to rescue a, a human baby who falls over a, a waterfall. And now they join forces and they're going to go out and they're going to take this human baby back to their parents. And then they're joined by Diego, a saber-toothed tiger who pretends to want to help them, but he's really trying to lead them into a trap so that he can steal the baby for his friends for food. But during these travels, something interesting happens. Diego finds himself in a pickle, and Manny the Mammoth saves Diego's life. And Diego has to begin to rethink his allegiances. He knows that nobody in his pack would have risked their life to save him. He's tasted grace, undeserved kindness and mercy, and it begins to change him. And of course, in the end, Diego reveals the plot to betray Manny and Sid, and together they narrowly escape and return the baby back. The point is, Diego was not a good kitty. He had evil intentions, but yet Manny rescued him anyway. He didn't wait for Diego to prove himself. And that simple act of grace alone towards Diego changed his heart for good. He willingly joined that ragtag herd of a mammoth, a sloth, and now a saber-toothed tiger, and he was committed to them to the death. Grace came to Diego before he committed to the herd. Grace took the first step towards him, not knowing how that would be met, not expecting anything in return. That's the nature of grace. It requires nothing, but once grace has been tasted, it produces a commitment that rules and requirements never could. Church, is that how we respond to those that are hurting outside of our herd? Or do we expect them to show some level of commitment to us? some level of commitment to the church before we'll, we're willing to help them, before we're willing to accept them, before we're willing to love them. I'm not talking about pretending that there's no sin, pretending that we're all Christians when we're not, 
pretending that somebody's saved when there's no evidence of saving faith. What I'm talking about is loving them anyway in the midst of their unbelief, in the midst of the mess that sin is making in their lives, and trusting that the kindness of God will lead them to repentance, like Romans 2, 4 says. Jesus' love and mercy drew those who were rejected by the religious and drew them to himself. And the Bible is clear that no servant is greater than their master. Let's follow our master. Listen, the love of God is wide enough to meet the needs of all hurting people. The question is, are we willing to walk in that kind of love? Besides being wide enough, God's love is also big enough to supply the magnitude of human need. Verse 32. And then Jesus called his disciples and said to him, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. Like I said, they, they hung around for a few days after. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we going to go to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven, and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending away the crowd, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadha. So we covered the feeding of the 5,000 just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm not going to go into all of the details again. If, if you're interested, that sermon's on our website and video. But what I do want to talk about is just a few of the differences between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, and then we'll tie them together again at the end. The two differences I want to focus on tonight, and I'm sure there are others, but these two we'll stick with tonight, and that is where it happened and for whom it happened, right? This feeding, according to Mark, happened in the Decapolis. As I already mentioned, that's the Gentile region of the Galilee, while the feeding of the 5,000 happened in the Jewish region of Bethsaida, right? We already talked about Bethsaida being one of those cities that Jesus pronounced woes on in chapter 11 because of their lack of faith after all of the miracles that they had seen Jesus doing. So Jesus, we see, again, is performing the same miracles amongst the Gentiles that he had done for the Jews. He continues to show the Jews that the Gentiles in that day, and us today, he's showing us all that the love of God is big enough to meet the spiritual hunger of both Jew and Gentile. If you remember a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about kingdom ministry, we talked about compassion being Jesus' motivation for ministry, and it should be our motivation for ministry, <coughs> also as we serve in his name. And we see that repeated here. It's compassion of Jesus to help those who can't help themselves. And in this case, he has that same compassion for irreligious Gentiles that he had for the religious Jews in Bethsaida. Two weeks ago, we also talked about the significance of what was left over at the end of each one of these miracles. It's worth mentioning again. So there's numbers and stuff, so try to stick with me. You can raise your hand if you're following behind, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to make it as clear as I can. The first feeding of the 5,000 was 5,000 Jews. And at the end, there were 12 baskets left over. In the scripture, 12 often represents Israel, right? 12 sons of Jacob, 12 tribes, and so on. And now, at the end of the feeding of the 4,000, there are seven baskets left. 
And seven in the scriptures is the number of completeness or wholeness, right? Seven days of creation, seven scrolls and seven bowls of judgment to complete all of God's judgment, so on and so on. So what we have here is a living illustration of what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Romans when he said the gospel would go to the Jew first and then the Gentile. As Jesus feeds the Jews and then collects 12 baskets afterwards, the number of Israel, he shows that the gospel would go to the Jew first. And then when he feeds 4,000 Gentiles and collects seven baskets, the number of wholeness, it's to show that the gospel would then spread to the whole Gentile world to complete God's plan. Now if you think that I'm stretching things here, let's turn to Mark chapter 8 just for a second, verses 18 through 21. And now... The interesting thing here is that Jesus is talking to the disciples about the, the, the problem of the leaven of the Pharisees. Unfortunately, during his talk about leaven, the disciples remember that they forgot their lunch. So he's talking about leaven, and like, I forgot to bring lunch. And so Julie and I had a good chuckle about this today. If, if you're not food obsessed, it probably doesn't mean a lot to you, but I... I felt for these guys here, right? Because if I remember I forgot my lunch in the middle of somebody's talk, I'll probably forget what they're saying too. But, so, but Jesus goes on and rebukes them and reminds them why he came. And he points to these two miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, and especially the number of baskets that he picked up to remind them of his purpose. Verse 18. Having eyes, do you not see? Here he is rebuking them. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take of? And they said to him, 12. And the, and the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand. Jesus ties these two miracles together and the number of baskets left to remind the disciples, including us, that God's love is big enough to meet the diversity of human being. I have to tell you, I'm going to throw this one in. I just discovered this this morning. It's not even in my notes. As I was looking at this passage, Jesus also points out how many he started out with. How many loaves he started out with. And wouldn't you know it, he starts out with the Jews with five loaves of bread. Five in the scripture is the number of grace. This is Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 12, the Jewish nation has already nationally rejected Jesus as their Messiah. And Jesus called it the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And yet, in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus feeds 5,000 Jews anyway. Grace. And he starts out with the Gentiles with seven. Right? It is the completion or the fullness of God's plan. And then he collects seven at the end. And as we were talking this morning, right? Jesus said, not one that the Father has given me will I lose. Started out with seven, ends with seven. Anyway, that was free with the price of admission. So Jesus ties these two miracles together. So when I first got out of the Navy, my first job was at a semiconductor fab in the city of industry. And we, we produced solar cells and solar panels for, for space applications. And I was a, a fresh out of the Navy electronics tech. And, and there was another technician there named Jose. And he was the guy who trained me. He was a really cool guy and a really clever one, too. Whenever he would take stuff apart, he would always put them back together with a common type of screw. Regardless of what kind of screw it came with, he would always put, the same, put everything back together with the same type of screws. And what that meant is that we could then work on everything in the plant that we needed to work on 
with a small screwdriver. That's all we needed. It was a small screwdriver on one end, and on the other end, an even smaller screwdriver that we called the tweaker that you can make electronic adjustments. If you're an electronics tech, you know what I'm talking about. When I say tweaker, I don't mean somebody on crystal meth. I mean a small tool. Um, did I say that? On? Erase that. Um, but in the meantime, right, mechanics are lugging these big roll-away toolboxes to their jobs, and, and we're walking around with a little screwdriver in our shirt pocket for 90% of the work that we needed to do. And, and Jose used to, he used to hold up that little screwdriver and said, if I can't fix it with this, I'm not your man, right? That was, that was kind of his funny saying. So, listen, as the church, God put broken people in this world together with a common screw. And there's only one tool that they need, all of them, all of us, and that is the love of God in the gospel. On the one end, the main tool is the sweeping good news that there is forgiveness of sin for all who believe in Jesus. And on the other end, that fine tool that shows all of the ways that God's love in the gospel addresses all of the intricate hurts and addictions and unique brokenness that each one of us has. The gospel is big enough to do all of that. Do you believe that the love of God in the gospel is what humanity Because God does. That's all he's given us. Now listen, there are those who are uniquely gifted and have been given as gifts to the body of Christ who know how to look into people's hearts and apply the gospel. People like Paul Tripp and Elise Fitzpatrick. Look them up on the internet, you'll be blessed. And I thank God for them. But they will tell you, as they clutch their little tool, the gospel, they will say, if I can't fix it with this, I'm not your man or I'm not your woman. We don't need something beyond the gospel to address our hurt, our pain, our loss, our disappointment, our brokenness. We only need to understand how the forgiveness bearing acceptance lavishing, identity restoring, love of God in the gospel applies to every area of our life and how it can restore to us the wholeness that all of us desire. God's love is small enough to be concerned with the personal faith of one person. It's wide enough to bring relief to everything that pains this world, no matter who you are. And it's big enough to meet all of our needs, no matter how big they might seem. Let's pray. Lord, Lord, I believe, but help me now. That is all of our biggest struggle, unbelief. Unbelief that you are who you said you are. That your love is as good and as sweeping as you said it was. That your forgiveness is as final as you said it is. That our place in your kingdom is as secure as you told us it is by faith. Lord, help our unbelief. Help us to believe that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we are part of that royal family when we put our faith in Jesus. And Lord, help us to realize that it's nothing we've done, but it's all that you've done. And help us to carry that grace outside of these four walls and to treat people with the grace that we've been shown by a holy God. 
Lord, how can we withhold that grace from a fellow sinner when we've been shown extravagant grace by a holy and innocent God? So, Lord, do your work in us. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name.